Uh, welcome to uh, this discussion of translating Conrad. Uh, Józef Konrad Kozienowski, a Polish nobleman born in Russian occupied or Russian uh, Ukraine uh, in the 19th century, who wrote in English, whose first language was Polish, knew French and Russian well before he learnt English. So we're going to talk about different types of translation of Conrad with an emphasis on uh, Polish, but also on visual translations. Uh, our guests, if you could welcome uh, from the furthest end of the table, Catherine Anyango, who illustrated the graphic edition. Yes. The graphic edition of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. We're going to see some of these illustrations. Uh, she studied at Central St. Martin's and Royal College of Art in London. And she's an artist with a special interest in the relationship of film and the use of cinematic devices in illustration. Then we have Magda Heidel, who teaches translation and comparative literature at the Department of Polish Studies at the Jagiellonian University in, in Kraków, Poland. She is one of the most eminent translators of literature from English uh, into Polish, and she translated Heart of Darkness into Polish. And immediately to my left, uh, Jacek Dukaj, who is one of Poland's best known authors, uh, is associated in particular with science fiction and speculative fiction, as the rega uh, regarded as the successor to Stanisław Lem. But most recently, he's been engaged in two separate uh, interesting translations of Joseph Conrad, particularly Heart, uh, Heart of Darkness. So, I would like to start by giving each of the participants just a short time, five minutes, to present to us uh, their projects, their Conrad translation projects, and from there we'll build this into a broader discussion, and we'll find time at the end uh, to involve all of you uh, with some questions. Um, so we, we'd like to start with the word and move from the word into the image. So and for that reason, we'll begin with uh, Magda Heidel, who will talk a little bit about her translation of Heart of Darkness, a work by a Pole <laughs> written in English, back into Polish, we might say. Thank you. It's not back into Polish, it's into <laughs> Polish from English. And that's, I think, is a very important point to make at the beginning of discussion of uh, Conrad as a English-Polish world uh, writer. I strongly believe that Conrad is a world writer. He is not and never will be uh, 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 limited as an author to one linguistic sphere. And I think uh, that uh, any attempt at pretending or making him being a Polish writer are ridiculous. <laughs> uh, and they don't and they cannot uh, 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 possibly work uh, for the uh, um, uh, better position of his writing or his reading, uh, actually, um, in any way. Um, the very fact that he has to be translated into Polish um, means uh, something. I mean, it, it is a uh, writing that is very strongly uh, present in Poland and very important for Polish literature and for Polish culture. But nevertheless, it is translated literature. It belongs to some larger uh, area of culture than just Polish writing. Um, I translated Heart of Darkness in, uh, it was published in 2011. Um, and my translation actually is the fifth um, uh, to be published in Poland. Uh, the first translation was made by Aniela Zagurska, who was Konrad's cousin and who translated most of his work, um, and they collaborated on some of the translations. So she discussed um, uh, her versions of Conrad's writing with, uh, with her cousin, um, uh, which uh, uh, places her translation in a very special position in the Polish canon. So uh, the canonized translations of Conrad are the ones by Aniela Zagurska, but they are 18 years old. I mean, trans uh, The Heart of Darkness was translated in 1930. So after 80 years, uh, you really need a new translation of a classic. Um, the, the life of a classic uh, is in translation. So my translation came late. Um, 
after three, uh, four other attempts at translating it in um, uh, after the um, copyright law, uh, copyright was um, um, uh, extinguished, um, uh, and my translation comes after at least three attempts of translating him as a uh, obligatory school reading position. Right, so Conrad is on the secondary school reading lists. Uh, so the publishers wanted to have cheap editions for the use of the students. Uh, my translation had a different aim. My translation was to be a part of a, or is a part of a um, series published by one of the major Polish publishers, Znak, uh, on the 50th anniversary. So my translation comes as a kind of celebration of Conrad and Conrad's writing and celebration of Polish publishing. I'm talking about all these things not because they are the most important aspects of, of uh, trans or the most interesting aspects of translating Conrad into Polish, but I think that his presence in Polish literature is very complex and it's influenced by many different uh, factors. And we have to remember about that, I think, when we discuss his uh, position as the element of the Polish uh, literary canon. Um, Okay, that, 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 that's a great start, and we'll come back to uh, the specific questions of your translation. Where Thank you very much, Magda. Um, if I could now ask uh, Jacek uh, to talk a little bit about his two projects, so one of them to trans another uh, translation of Heart of Darkness into Polish, but of a particular kind, and also a, a particular virtual reality uh, project of Heart of Darkness uh, that Jacek has that been collaborating with. I feel there should be two of me. Uh, since uh, my, I've been involved with two separate projects, uh, translating, adapting uh, Heart of Darkness uh, of Conrad. One is uh, more a purely literary project. I use term in Polish, spolszczenie, which has no good equivalent in English. It would be like polonization, but it's, it's not good. It's not that uh, uh, meaning. Uh, so I would use this uh, horrible uh, term, pseudo-translation, which means I'm trying to translate, but not in a traditional sense. Uh, what I try to do, um, I will start with the position of author. What tra author tries to do? Tra author try uh, tries basically to mess with your mind, to change your uh, perception of the world, change your uh, personality, uh, uh, at least for some time, change the way you feel, you experience uh, a world. How does he uh, uh, do it? By using words, by using different phrases. This is basically his art. The only means he has at his disposal are words. If he knows uh, good enough uh, times he lives in, culture, uh, what people uh, uh, live, other people live, uh, live like, what is the side guys basically, he knows which button to, to push to achieve certain goal. And what do we have after some time when Otto dies, his uh, contemporary death dies, we only have this uh, uh, cold, uh, dead uh, record of means he used in, in form of words. And those words remain the same. We change as readers. We are completely different now. We live in a different way. We use language differently. We experience, experience world, uh, world different, uh, differently. And the same words, when they reach our minds, uh, inflict completely different changes in us. This is not the way uh, the particular work of art was supposed to uh, affect us. So what to do to go back to the original meaning? Quoting, quoting, uh, quoting. It's all very uh, risky, what you yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you quote, can argue later, Mark. Quoting <laughs> uh, 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 Lampedusa, everything has to change, uh, so the, uh, everything remains the same. <laughs> so one has to change means used to achieve the same goal that the author at, the, at his time wanted to achieve. Of course, this is purely arbitrary choice on my part. I have to make some very risky decisions, what actually Conrad had in mind when he written these particular words. And then I would try to find similar means to achieve the same goal. But those means can be radically different in terms of words, phrases, narrative, literature, basically. So I'm not uh, suggesting uh, that my method is the best one and should replace traditional translation. By no means. There's like six or seven uh, already existing traditional translation of Heart of Darkness uh, into Polish. But I think it would 
vastly broaden the reception, the experience uh, uh, people get from reading uh, uh, Heart of Darkness and probably open up different kind of thinking about literature uh, in general. Thank you. So this is kind of literary adaptation, almost as uh, Apocalypse Now is a cinema yeah, cinematic but adaptation. Yeah, I would argue that this is the one most faithful. Okay, we'll come back to this. Could you quickly um, lay out the virtual reality project that you've been involved with? We've got some images so to I show. I'll play of this. the short clip. I just hope it does well. So this is translating Heart of Darkness into a virtual reality experience. What a show! What a show! Unbelievable! Very clever! Okay, how do we stop it? You know that, Dad? How do I stop it? Yep. So, just in a few words before we move on to Catherine, so, could you give a summary of what the idea of this project, which is unfinished? Seen, uh, what we've seen there is a two dimensional presentation of uh, uh, virtual reality uh, content developed by a studio for the Netherlands called Masmalo. They developed it as a kind of uh, biological educational exercise in recreating uh, Umwelt. Uh, sense, uh, world of uh, world of senses, world experience, world of animals of different species. So supposedly, the man uh, putting on headset, vi uh, virtual uh, reality headset, should hear and see a world of the forest the way the particular animals see and hear it. And we wanted to use uh, this technique uh, to create. Uh, uh, the jungle to which uh, uh, Marlow would journey to the uh, to, to, to cards. Uh, obviously, uh, this whole project uh, uh, fall apart. We uh, didn't uh, find enough money to uh, go forward, so it's good only now as a pretext for discussions like this. Uh, uh, but the whole idea was uh, based on. I would say discovery or interpretation uh, of uh, Heart of Darkness as a sort of prefiguration of virtual reality. And I will try very shortly to uh, defend this thesis. Uh, uh, if you remember how uh, the story starts, uh, how uh, Conrad uh, sets uh, the stage for uh, Marlow storytelling. Uh, we, are, we are on the uh, river Thames on the boat. A uh, uh, night falls on London and one after another all senses of people uh, listening to Marlowe are being shut off. So they don't see anything, this complete darkness. They stop uh, uh, hearing anything except the voice of Marlowe. There is nothing much to do, so all other senses are basically all uh, uh, being shut off. So this is uh, uh, the closest thing they could get in the 19th uh, century to a virtual reality experience, when you are basically being shut off from the world and your uh, streams of data, uh, streams of data your brain receives are being replaced by other 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 source. So of course the o the only problem was that uh, uh, Conrad didn't have uh, technology needed at the time. He had only words, but um, we don't have now uh, time to uh, quote from his uh, preface to uh, the Niger of, Na of the Narcissus. But he um, explained very clearly there uh, what is his goal as a writer, basically to pack into words uh, uh, sensations, sights, uh, sounds, 
uh, sensations of, of touch. Uh, so the reader could then unpack them again in his imagination and live through those experiences. And this is the only way uh, in which Connell at the time can transfer uh, his vision, uh, existential states of his characters, of his, or, or uh, his own existential uh, state, uh, to the minds uh, of readers. But now we have technology who could replace this uh, middle part, this packing into words and unpacking from words. So uh, this opens the possibility of. Uh, Again, being more truthful, uh, truthful, uh, truthful to the uh, uh, Conrad himself, that he was able to be using uh, more literary uh, means by using virtual technology. So this obviously is a, a can of worms, which opens a lot of uh, different, even philosophical uh, 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 topics, digressions, problems. Uh, but I'm not. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Atsek. Um, could I now throw over to Catherine uh, to talk about her visual translation uh, of Heart of Darkness? and I think I can take up where you left off a little bit um, with the idea that we all know how much Conrad packed sensations into words. And when I was asked to um, create a visual adaptation, my first question was how to get so many words, because we had to take out all the words, how to get that many words back into a picture. Um, and so I'm just going to talk through a few of the visual processes I uh, went through for that. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is the book that I've made is quite dark, and superficially there is a lot of darkness in, in Heart of Darkness. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's shaded, it's forested, it's, you know, it's gloomy, it's crepuscular, but um, and he talks a lot about uh, the, uh, the actual physical sensation of light and dark, so one thing I did was to just try and bring that out in the placement of light, placement of the, the lighthouse, the dominoes, etc. Um, and I'm also showing some process images because that was kind of my translation um, style. But what I want to talk about more is uh, this sort of non-superficial darkness, the, 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 the abject. If um, you know um, Julia Kristeva's power of horror, the abject is a con condition that disturbs systems, disturbs identity, and disturbs order. And I feel like colonial rule is, is a sort of um, perfect example of the abject because it goes into a place and completely deconstructs the identity of, of the people. And I think Conrad was really talking a lot about this in his words. Um, he also uses the uncanny a lot in the, in the sense that uh, the words are so formal and beautiful and perfect but what they're talking about is extremely horrific. So I was trying to um, try and mirror this with my um, visual adaptation uh, to try and create this extremely rich, immersive uh, world. <laughs> Not a VR world, but uh, something which would draw you in by its beauty and then spit you out with the uh, the details of what had actually happened. Um, and he talks about it so nice. I mean, I think he must have just really enjoyed writing these sort of trees, trees, uh, um, this world of silence and plants. And he talks about the, this world awakening some brutal instincts in both Marlowe and Conrad. Um, and I think that was really interesting in that the place itself was an agent uh, for brutality. Um, so. It's quite a pleasure talking about Heart of Darkness to people who've read it, because normally <laughs> all my students, they, they sort of, yeah, they don't have the story. So as he goes down the river, uh, Marlowe becomes increasingly um, troubled. Uh, he's going towards, he's going towards um, Kurtz. His own mental state is also breaking down, and so I became really interested in texture and drawing as a way to try and get that out. Um, and trying to use uh, extremely fragmented texture to talk about the fragmentation of his mind, but also to start to see, in a way, through the picture and, you know, to something more abstract and emotional. Um, so, 
these are just some of those images. Um, what I what I did was draw them extremely um, tiny, so that when I blew them up, they would uh, break apart and fragment. Um, and so this is this is the image that came from oops that came from that. Um, when Kristeva talks about order breaking down within a system, I also thought about the graphic novel as a system, as a, the pages as a, a layout, and a, a layout as a system. And so as he went down the river, I started to play with the panel borders as well. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well on this image, but uh, the border, uh, Marlowe is ble bleeding into the background. Um, uh, and the borders of the panels are also breaking apart. So the sort of the, the gap between him and um, what he sees as the other is really breaking down. Um, and actually, one of my favorite quotes from this, and I guess we'll talk about this later, is um, how he, because Chinua Achebe has really um, attacked the book for being racist, but one of the quotes he says is the idea that it came to you slowly, the idea that they were not inhuman. So he was actually maybe being a bit honest about his reaction to, uh, to the end. We can talk about that later. Um, and here, uh, to, to suggest that this is, this is Kurt and there's Marlowe, they're both, um, uh, this, this page, the, the, the text is, Kurt had kicked himself loose of this earth. He had gone mad, by, by heavens he'd gone mad. And so I actually put him outside the structure of the panels completely to try and remove him from the order and the layout of the book. And here again, both men are um, on the way to losing their sanity, but um, Marlowe still has a vestige of uh, a profile, whereas Kurtz has become kind of very uh, Picasso-esque. Um, and here, these are just small things, but um, uh, Marlowe is uh, bisected in all of the panels, whereas other people follow them through. And so just a quick note on the colonial aspect. Um, this was very hard for me. The research put me in a very dark place. And um, I tried to leave little clues in the book um, that, you know, to constantly refer back to the fact that this is a historical event, a true event. And it's something which is also a little bit whitewashed um, in certain countries who are responsible for it. So <laughs> I tried to keep little visual um, things. And to bring out the horror without flinching, um, to sort of also try and make a character out of every Congolese person that's mentioned in the book because they aren't really given identities. Um, they are spoken of as you know, people being beaten or people being oppressed. And so I tried to sort of give them a little bit more character than that um, because the idea of who owns the narrative is a very important um, thing when we're looking at this book because uh, a lot of imagery from the time, well this is a bit later, but there was a lot of propaganda by the Ministry of the Colonies talking about how, uh, how wonderful it was that they were there and you know, all the good things that were happening. So I, I thought it was important to sort of re-calibrate um, uh, that image a little bit. Uh, and this, yeah, I'll talk about that later. Another thing with the system of the book is how much space to give something on the page. So this was the skipper that um, Marlowe befriended and uh, I thought it was quite poetic in the book the way he talked about their friendship. So I gave him a whole double spread in the end when he went to his watery death. Um, and again, they, um, Marlowe and the captain are taking up very little space in the page compared to the evidence of uh, what the colonial rule has uh, established. And here, um, someone is talking about the relationship that Kurtz has with the tribe in that he, they love him and he controls them. But by, oh, by matching, uh, in cinema, you have a match cut, which means you can uh, take visually similar elements and um, put them in the same place, which creates an ideological uh, link between them. So by putting the, the ivory, the bullets, and the tribe on the same sort of level, you start to see a relationship between them, which is what um, Conrad does in the text. But obviously, we couldn't have the text there. Um, and this is another example of that, because in the text, you can say, he was like the head. He'd, uh, he sees these heads on sticks. Um, and I put them on the same level to show that at this point, Marlowe has really reached the same point as these heads on sticks outside Kurtz's house because he's completely doomed. And I'm, I'm ready now. I can okay, see you. <laughs>
very much. Sorry to, to, to rush you, but we're running short of time. We want to get some dialogue going. I was very struck by the way, uh, extraordinary final, some of the last pages where those heads appear in a ghostly form in the drawing room where Marlo is meeting the intended uh, of, of Kurtz. This was beautifully done. Um, I, I'd like to bring Magda back into the conversation now. And I was going to ask you if you could talk about some of the challenges of translating Conrad's prose, but I also want to give you the opportunity to p polemicize uh, with Jacek so that we can open up the, this uh, no, I, I, I conversation. I don't think space for translatological disputes here, so I'm not going to answer I think this, there's them. very much space for that. Uh, but uh, I wanted to say that Catherine's uh, and David Myrovitz's um, uh, adaptation of Heart of Darkness was very important for me. I was given this book when I was working on Tra Heart of Darkness, and uh, I don't know if I can say that it influenced me, but it definitely was an important... Uh, aspect um, uh, in my interpretation of the text. It's very interesting that you should mention um, uh, senses and uh, be, senses being blocked and senses being opened because I think that in this novel what is the most important element constructing senses uh, meanings is um, that Marlowe is a voice and that so much happens in the voice so finding the right voice for the narrator who uh, is there all the time in every picture as if um, uh, every scene of this novel is is absolutely fundamental for getting the translation right and another thing that makes me uh, 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 now kind of interested me very much is that you were saying about putting the meaning of the word into pictures, how to squeeze so many words into these images. Well, my problem is was just the opposite, how to make my words, without making too many of them uh, in the Polish version, mean what they do in the, um, in the original. I think that Conrad's prose is so dense and so packed with sensations and with uh, um, uh, the planned reactions, if you want, uh, that this is also something that was very, very difficult for me and very challenging for me in, in producing the Polish version. Now, uh, 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 coming back to the, the canonical translation by Aniela Zagurska, eight years old uh, now, so uh, um, uh, she uh, represented a different uh, stylistic uh, stage of the development of Polish, if you like, right? So his, her writing is very much um, uh, marked with the stylistics of the um, uh, founder siècle Polish literature. Um, I wanted to get rid of any kind of sentimentality or uh, archaic stylistics in my translation. So what I was doing, and somebody pointed that, actually I was, I was, I was shown these things later um, by people, by my students, um, I was trying to be very... Um, I, I was, I was very, I am very colloquial in many uh, 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 scenes and many instances of, of conversations. So I wouldn't uh, use polite forms. I would use short forms. Uh, I would use shortcuts. I would use uh, um, uh, things that make it uh, really like a living Polish language. Um, and I think I was very aware of making this translation reflect the way I feel language as a means of communication, as a means of of showing emotions. Marlow is very emotional at times. He tells the story. I mean, he's, he's out of it, but he's in it at the same time. And this is also important for translating this text, uh, as you have shown uh, in, your, in your pictures. Uh, so he's, for example, he's, he's shouting at his friends, well, listen to me. Do you listen? Do you, do you hear me? Can you hear anything? Can you understand anything? Do you see anything? Well, he knows that they don't see anything, actually. So, so I was very trying to be, uh, I was trying to be very, very kind of aggressive in his his emotional, um, the emotional makeup of what, what he's saying. So it was not about words, but about what the words carry. And I think this was difficult. Of course, many other things which were challenging, like the, um, the um, um, racist aspect of this prose, all right? I, d I don't agree that Conrad is, uh, is a racist. I think he is the one that he's a man at the point of discovering that something that he saw or he took as a neutral kind of, of, of 
of world uh, uh, um, management is in fact charged and that he has to do something about it. He's discovering himself through this experience. Um, I'm not trying to defend him, all right? But there's this word nigger uh, he uses all the time, which is a, a nowadays especially, right? Something that you, you cannot really use uh, in any language. Now in Polish, there is a choice between czarnuch, which is really a, a term of abuse, and the word murzyn, which used to be a neutral word for black-skinned people. We, we, we don't have colored people in Poland. So, you know, all this discussion is also uh, related to the kind of social and cultural environment. Uh, uh, Poland is terribly homo uh, 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 in this sense. So, so I went for Mujin, which is a neutral term, um, but becoming already, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's now already perceived as, as, as a politically incorrect uh, um, uh, word. So, so this kind of things. Another thing, con uh, sorry, the last, last point I wanted to make, <laughs> there's so much to talk about, um, is the feminist uh, interpretations of Heart of Darkness, which are very interesting and very powerful, and and um, Conrad uses the word man, uh, meaning either human being or a man. This is man's world, isn't it? I mean, Card of Darkness is a world of man uh, for man, and women are just uh, uh, on the margins of it. They are very important. They are, they are fundamental for this world to keep you know, not to fall apart, but but still they are not subject. So I was trying. In many cases, I used mężczyzna, which is uh, man, uh, meaning the the the, the male human being rather than the generic uh, człowiek uh, meaning human being to make sure that the the message goes through right so you have to take the decision in polish so i in many cases i took the decision to make it uh, uh, more feminist than probably uh, any of the other translators um, uh, try to Thank you very much. So as Catherine foreshadowed, uh, the question of Conrad's racism and Achebe's uh, interpretation is important here. I think Jacek has a couple of words he wants to say about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. At first, uh, when you pointed me to this uh, famous Achebe uh, essay, uh, I was uh, inclined to defend uh, Conrad, uh, uh, arguing that uh, Achebe's stance was uh, basically ahistoric. For those, by the way, that don't know, the words that Achebe used in the original version of the essay was that Conrad is a bloody racist. Uh, that was then revised to a thoroughgoing racist uh, in, the, in the next edition. But of course, it opened up a whole series of important debates uh, in, in post-colonial interpretations. Then, then I started to work really closely on the text uh, itself, re reading it, uh, recreating in my mind uh, uh, the mind of an author and... Uh, uh, trying to decipher his intention, intentions, I really noticed that there is a kind of unhealthy obs obsession, so to speak, uh, revealed, uh, revealed on the level of language. Precisely those things that Achebe, Achebe points to. Uh, blackness, uh, um, unpenetrable uh, 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 darkness. Inscrutability. Uh, some, yeah, mm -hmm. a, a, lot, a lot of those uh, adjectives starting with in on an. Uh, and uh, so I would concede that, uh, in the sense that Achebe uses this word, uh, Conrad was uh, a racist. But, and here is my argument, uh, I would use the tool of uh, psychoanalysis to uh, describe this uh, uh, starting point as a, a Conrad as an artist. There is not one Conrad. There, were, there was a Conrad uh, race, racist, but there was another Conrad inside of him who was visibly struggling against those emotions, there were at least two Conrads inside, and from this struggle, this work of art was conceived. And I'm not saying that uh, literary val value outweighs some social injustice and so on. I'm saying that because Conrad inside him had version of him as a racist, he was able, through the struggle, only in this way, to create this uh, work of art, which is so powerful, hypnotic, and so on. Most of those uh, work of art of this magnitude comes from uh, that sure. unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. And from struggle. Yeah. Th thank you. Can I throw across to Catherine? I have a specific question here on this point, because one of the, uh, one of the defenses of Conrad against the Shebe's article was that, that literary scholars made was that we, we cannot identify Marlowe with Conrad. 
So I was very struck by the choice that you made immediately from the first pages to identify Marlowe very directly with Conrad because Marlowe has the same features. It is clearly Joseph Conrad that you've drawn uh, aboard the ship uh, in the Thames estuary and then the younger version of him that appears. Could you talk a little bit about that translation choice or interpretation choice um, in, in your illustrations? Um, well, I, I was quite keen to identify Marlow with Conrad because as um, Jacek was saying, is, can you hear me? Can we hear? It's very no. weak. Oh. Sound from this microphone. Nah. It's better? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was quite keen to identify them with each other because I kind of saw them how, how you do, like one within another. And I think it is a, a thinly veiled autobiography um, that he's written. And also, like I was, uh, I started to talk about this idea of the, the, the very um, deep psychological process that he goes through when he's going down that river of uh, transforming from a person with one idea to transforming into a person with another idea about this group of people. I think that's not something you can um, give a character without having gone through yourself. Um, and so I feel like it was important to show his revelation uh, as both a character and a, as an author because it was also, I mean, Heart of Darkness was, was so important to exposing the colonial rule back in um, Europe uh, along with Roger Casement's report. Um, and so I thought he maybe deserved a little bit of kudos for that. <laughs> it was also, I mean, uh, practical uh, to, to use these pictures of Conrad because, uh, you know, one must get some, one's characters from somewhere. <laughs> And he has a very expressive face exactly. as well. Exactly. It must have been, was it enjoyable to draw Conrad's face? Ah, pretty much. Um, the younger version of Conrad was my boyfriend at the time, and it was not fun for him because he hated it. <laughs> so uh, the older Conrad was much more amenable to being drawn. But um, this, I think in terms of, uh, just back to the race and back to the idea of Conrad, and, and I mean, because he did make that journey. And uh, I think... He talks about this kinship he feels with uh, the, the people dancing and wailing by the riverside. And I think him having that kinship, feeling that kinship with them, is the same sort of kinship that Marlowe and um, Conrad have. Uh, it's sort of layers of a, uh, a personality, in a way. Thank you. May I just um, add, may I just add a, a little footnote um, concerning Conrad's Polishness and the possible context for reading this. Um, of course, Conrad travelled down Congo River, and, and this is partly uh, a description of his own experience. But also, as a very young boy, he was um, travelling uh, as a political um, um, prisoner with his parents in Russia, Tsarist Russia, which was basically a huge empty black space i mean it was not black in the in the in the sense of you know black people living there or or or, or, or the kind of vegetation but uh, the ex of meeting was this undefined uh, huge space which brings you nothing but fear and misery uh, is something that I, I am not trying to imply that it's the, the source of, of Heart of Darkness or the most important aspect of, or factor of, of interpretation here but I think that this part of his life as a very young boy uh, uh, he, was, he was 12 10 or 12 something like that, uh, is, uh, may also shed additional light on the way he perceives space and perceives uh, the danger out there. In, indeed, and also Poland's history being exposed to a kind of dual colonial context, a, sort of a quasi-colonial history that Poland has in the east, in Ukraine, where Conrad is from, and then a sense of Poland having been colonized or at least subordinated to an imperial power uh, from the 18th century onwards. Um, Jacek, could I ask, I, I completely agree with Magda that trying to turn Conrad into a Polish writer uh, is not productive, um, but English was not his first language. Uh, and some critics have noticed syntactical structures of Polish that lie under the surface of his English in various ways. And I'm wondering, Jacek, if you notice this and if you could discuss uh, this uh, a little. Or elements of the text that you found to be Polish in some way, which for a Polish translator of his work might be interesting. No, no. <laughs> I didn't find any that I was focused on, but I found uh, the 
uh, character of Harlequin and his narrative to be hugely influenced by Russian uh, syntax and Russian yes. uh, tradition of uh, those uh, laments, uh, confessions, very long uh, uh, revealings of one's heart that is uh, so uh, uh, common in, in Russian literature. And I tried in my... His character is Russian, of course. Yeah, yeah, but there is... Uh, not obvious to an English reader uh, reading the original version, so I uh, made it much more visible, uh, uh, much more accented in my version. Basically, the Harlequin talks as if it was uh, uh, not very well translated Russian uh, uh, story. And there is a lot that sort of slips through to the uh, narrative surrounding uh, uh, the character of, of, of Harlequin. Um, Magda, would you like to quickly add something to uh, that? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, this is very strange because I agree that there is no, for me as a reader and translator, there is no uh, evident layer of Polish syntax or Polishness in, in Conrad's language. But I also translate Virginia Woolf and you may remember that Virginia Woolf said talking about the, uh, the authors who could influence her generation. She says, well, there's nobody who could really be a, a, a model writer for us. Well, there's Mr. Conrad, but he's obviously a Pole, so he's of no use to us. Uh, now, when I translate Virginia Woolf, when I started translating Virginia Woolf, it was, it was one of the most difficult things for me to... Uh, um, to find a way to deal with her sentences. And they are very beautiful, they are very clear, they are very complex as well. But it was kind of, it, it really, I, I really struggled to, to find a way of putting her sentences into Polish. Now with Conrad, who also writes complex, difficult sentences in English, it's much easier. It somehow just works as, as, I, as I write, you know, and I discovered that I'm, I'm working on his short stories. When I was doing the, um, uh, the Outpost, of Pro, Outpost of Progress, I discovered that it, the text just writes itself. It's not <laughs> just, you know, but that, that, that I have, I just translated Heart of Darkness. It's not a huge material. I translated seven books by Virginia Woolf and I still struggle. With, with Conrad, I feel that there is something in the imagination of the language, perhaps, all right, uh, if you know what I mean. The, the, for translators, there's something, there's a Mat quality. Matrix and, of the language. Mm, mm, I am, I'm not quite sure about it being a matrix. I think it's the images behind the words. Mm. It's the, the, the concepts that he finds, uh, um, he can combine in sentences and in, in, in scenes. This is very hard to, to describe to, 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 to somebody who never did translation or did uh, literary uh, interpretation. But this is very strange, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's not the phrases, it's not the idioms, it's really something beneath this, the surface of language that makes it um, easily writable in, into Polish, if I may put it like that. Okay, we're, we're re running very short on time and I do want to have a little time for questions at least. So could I just ask Catherine if we could, um, why do you think uh, Conrad's Heart of, Heart of Darkness has been so conducive to creative retranslation and reinterpretation in various ways? Um, why did you choose to reinterpret this text uh, visually? What's its relevance today? Well, I mean, the, the visual appeal is sort of clear in what we've talked about in terms of the way he writes the central unpacking of, of words. I think it's also very attractive because it's such a small book, but it's so big at the same time. So it, I mean, if you know what, if you know what I mean. <laughs> because when I first picked it up to, to work with, I was like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, I can read this on the loo. And then, the, but it, it's sort of really so much there. And it, it, as a, you know, as someone who's really interested in the power of drawing or just the power of um, texture and pencil to have meaning, it was a perfect um, vessel, I think. Um, it's also, for me, a, a sort of strange story in that it's not... Um, Apocalypse Now, I feel, is completely different because that's sort of something about glory and empire, but... Uh, Heart of Darkness is so slow and so sad um, that it's sort of many different stories at once, in a way. And I think, uh, like I said, the, the, the fact that it did expose um, the, a lot was very important, be, having been such a, a small book. 
Does it have particular relevance to us today then? You're talking here about this historical yeah. relevance that it had yeah. at exposing yeah. a particular colonial reality. Yeah, I mean, because you you can you can read it as uh, at, at the the events that are happening in Heart of Darkness um, are not happening today. That period of um, Belgian rule is over, but the same sort of power structures um, are still uh, happening all over the world. And actually, what's dangerous is I think that the brutality and power is more hidden now. In Heart of Darkness, it's all on the surface. You know people just beaten and thrown into the river. Um, and the same sort of thing happens now, but just, I think, behind the scenes. So we need a new heart of darkness to... Uh, <laughs> to your your colleague, your collaborator, compares the Anglo-Belgian trading company with a modern-day multinational, for yeah, instance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, also, I try to use this kind of names, uh, vocabulary, uh, even acronyms uh, taken from 25th century capitalists. So there is no company, there is corporation, there are CEOs. Mm -hmm. Basically, they talk the way people on Bl uh, Bloomberg channel talk. So, <laughs> I just say one more thing. I, I, I really think that this idea of travel and the sea um, as, a, as a sort of traumatic modern thing, uh, bringing people back and forth, colonialism, imperialism, is what Conrad describes in Heart of Darkness in his reaction to the other is exactly what's happening now when we have people coming over the sea as um, refugees and we think we're beyond that mindset but um, it's just the other way around and the sort of the, the idea of the hero going out into the uncivilized world has come um, has flipped over and uh, it's a very ambiguous sort of time as Marlow says of the Thames estuary, this too has been one of the dark places. Yeah. Um, Magda, would you like to say a, a final uh, <laughs> word on that before we throw open to a few questions? Uh, I strongly believe that we need retranslations of, of great literature because it speaks different voice to us uh, um, than it did in time when the book was written or translated for the first time. Uh, we've experienced, we, saying the Western world, uh, uh, experienced two world wars and and uh, the process of uh, um, uh, post-colonialism uh, and the end of the colonial era, so much has happened in the 20th century, uh, both globally and locally, that this text needs to have a new voice, I, I believe, uh, over and over again, uh, to, uh, to acknowledge all these uh, um, processes, to, to, to see the other uh, meanings which are born not from in the text or from the text, but they are born in the space between the readers who are experiencing the world as they do and the text itself, I think. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you to ask some questions now. Uh, do we have a roving microphone? Uh, we do. Oh, wonderful. So why don't we collect three questions to begin with, uh, and then we'll see where we go from there. So could you please raise your hand if you would like to uh, ask a question? Please introduce yourself very briefly. Uh, I'm Marta Jurosz, I'm a Polish literature translator, and I have a question for Catherine. I was very interested uh, to hear you speak about Kristeva and, um, and her idea of the abject. And it's so very closely related to the body. And I was kind of wondering what's your, you know, you spoke about repackaging ideas into images. How about repackaging and retranslating the body into the image? Um, shall I pass them? Let's along? collect two more questions right. quickly, and then and Thank then we'll have some much, answers. Everyone. Raise your hand again. It's if fascinating. You. Who else would like to ask a question? Uh, one at the front. Uh, my my name is Nikolai, so I'm from Russia, and my name my question to Magda: uh, What was the acceptance of your new translation in uh, critique in the critics? circle and within the readers circle because as I know in Russia we have a big problem with this revitalization of the uh, translations and we have a uh, big problems because people they just don't want to accept these new versions of the classical novels and they just think that they we do not need we don't need these new translations because you know the same text text is the uh, same so and uh, so, th this question is 
important than the taste, I think. One more question. Uh, in the middle there. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Olga Kubinska, University of Gdańsk, Translation Studies Department. University of Gdańsk means Poland. Uh, and I, have a, I wanted to thank all of you guys because it was fascinating. But since we have only time for one, one more question, I would like to ask question, combined question to Catherine and to Magda. Uh, would you compare your most moving drawings, most moving drawings, would you compare the disillusionment, uh, lack of sentimentality in your translation, in words, and your multimodal uh, translation, because this is what you have what you have done. Would you see they were parallel, that you also wanted to get rid of this sentimentality and to show the disillusionment? Because you, you, you've mentioned the first words of one of the first words from the very beginning of a, of a, of a text by, by, by Conrad. This too has been uh, or used to be uh, wilderness. But then we have this ending and it's kind of, uh, it's like bracketing the whole, the whole novel. But those last words of, of, of Kurt horror, horror, horror from Shakespeare. Would you have this in the, in the, in the, in the drawings? And would you find that your, your two translations were parallel in a way? Thank you. Okay, uh, Catherine, would you like to start with whichever of the questions you want to respond to? Sure. <laughs> um, yes, uh, um, close to the mic, sorry. Sorry, um, if I got your question right, uh, uh, you said that you repackage uh, text into words and you were asking about the abject and how you can repackage the body into the visual. And I can talk about that specifically in terms of Heart of Darkness maybe, because in my work I do that a lot. But um, one thing which, Chris David talks a lot about the body um, and the sort of ultimate or the most extreme form of this is the corpse. Um, and she describes the corpse as the ultimate border of our conditions as a living being. So it's really the edge. Um, and it, she also describes it as that thing which is not that permits me to be. So it's, it's a little bit like um, the, there but for the grace of God go I. And so I really tried to use the, the corpse in here to um, remind Marlowe and remind us of the proximity to that border. Um, for example, when we have the, the, um, this page where um, the, the relationship between man and corpse is not so different because all through the book, the relationship between the colonized man and the corpse is quite close and not seen, they're not seen as different things. They're, they're described as dead or alive without um, much debate. But to then talk about the white man in that context became quite interesting as well. Does that, make, does that answer your question? <laughs> Magda, and then we can... Yeah. All right, sh shall, shall we perhaps answer the, the final question together before I talk just the, yeah. uh, 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 shortly about the reception of the, of the translation? Um, it's very difficult for us to, to... I mean, perhaps it's easier for me to say if my translation is parallel to Catherine's uh, uh, visual adaptation or not, because I had the, the, the book on my desk when I was working. Um, Conrad's novel is not sentimental at all. I mean, so it's not the question of getting rid of sentimentality. You know, I, perhaps I used the right, wrong word when I was talking about Zagurska's translation. It's, for me, it's just too elegant, mm. right? It's just too... Um, uh, ladylike, I would say. Okay, I wanted it to make wanted to make it more brutal, more more straightforward, and more colloquial. Uh, and I think I, I I don't know. It's for somebody else to to see whether I I do parallel things to what Catherine did. I would love to be able to do parallel things in language <laughs> to what Catherine does with her pencil. Um, but um, but definitely there is something. There is a a darkness, but also a kind of dirtiness to this world. I would say, or this is not completely black and white, it's really dark brown, it's like a mud color and this is also, this was very important for me, there is, it's, this world is, is dirty, it's muddy, it's awful, it's stinky uh, so, so, I don't know I'd be happy if somebody showed these qualities in my translation mm -hmm. um, I guess I could just add to that, so um, the idea of unsentimental um, I mean, yes, you're right. It is not a sentimental book. There's so much 
I think one of the lines is that such savagery could happen in the sunshine. So it's just it's just mm. all out there. Um, and I was trying in that way to be very realistic, very um, precise um, with the way I drew things. So there was no sort of um, room for uh, for interpretation. It was it was just all happening, and um, I guess that sort of formality is part of his text and part of my work. But I'm not sure I've answered your question properly because it was such a good question, but you almost answered it yourself. <laughs> Magda, could you very could, briefly yeah. answer? Uh, uh, all right. Second, so and then if someone has a question so for Jacek, please yeah. raise their hand or all a right. general <laughs> question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just, just very briefly about the reception of the translation. Um, it was well received and I am very proud to say that the passage from this translation was entered into a school book for secondary yeah. school uh, yeah. um, <laughs> schools. So this is something I'm really, really proud of. But of course, many people still read Zagorska and rightly so, because you know it has its place in the in the canon. Um, it's my translation is different from the other contemporary ones uh, from the 1990s, which would which were made clearly for the purpose of school reading, cheap school reading edition would bring money to the publishers. And I think this is something that should be punished with prison. Because this is, you know, giving kids uh, uh, rubbish instead of language. I'm not saying that my uh, translation is you know, should replace these uh, other <laughs> translations, but but I think that that this is an important element uh, in in education to have pretty language and, and or, or ugly language in the for that matter. I, I think so I'm allowed to interrupt to say that it's been very well received, Magda's translation. So congratulations. <laughs> Yay. Um, final question, very concisely. I hope it's something that Jacek can respond to. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so my name is Michał Marczek. I'm a software developer. No affiliation to any literary institutions. Um, my question is on, on the issue of racism. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll try to make this really quick. Very concise, but we're just <laughs> about concise. out of time. Um, so I, I'm under the impression that it is tempting to try and excuse a brilliant mind because it is very hard to come face to face with the possibility uh, that, the, um, that those who are truly most brilliant among us, mm. they, uh, they are themselves guilty um, and complicit uh, in in what what in in what causes what li what lies at the root of issues such as racism in society. Uh, Conrad was a product of a uh, of a thoroughly racist society, and it would truly really be a marvel uh, if he had somehow escaped that influence. So um, we uh, I, I think we should celebrate uh, we should celebrate his. Um, his ability uh, to to be true to his um, well, true to his mode of thinking, if you will, uh, and free of any temptation to cover up for his sins, if you will. Uh, in um, so, we, we should be thankful for his ability to, by being being eminently truthful. Uh, in his narrative. He says, I, I agree with your statement, but what is the question? Uh, well, the question is, is it necessary to, to try and excuse him and to find uh, ways... Who is, who's, who's making those excuses? Uh, well, I thought perhaps you suggested that uh, that um, that that Conrad would more accurately be described as uh, well a non-racist person struggling with no, racist influence. No, 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 no. I concede there was a okay. Conrad racist, but there was mm -hmm. also another Conrad inside mm -hmm. him, and we see the result of the struggle between two Conrads as a work of art. Okay. Well. The, do you get this uh, psychological me mechanism? Well, I, I, I think I, I see what you what you suggest. I, 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 I wonder I wonder if this is a but this is but no means a, a excuse. I'm not making any ethical statements here. Neither am I. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm but I, I think obviously this it does raise the question. We read Conrad today with our values, and it is right that we do so, and we can't avoid doing that either. So this, I, I suppose, returns to this question of the necessity of new translations. Magda mentioned the way in which she was sensitive to the to precisely the question of language and and the connection of language with with race in the translation that she was doing. Uh, that's presumably a difference with the earlier Zagurska translation. So, 
we're going to have to unfortunately finish what's been a fascinating conversation there. I realize that I very rudely neglected to introduce myself at the beginning of the... <laughs> so uh, uh, I have been Stanley Bill Lecturer in Polish <laughs> Studies at the University of Cambridge. Could you please oh join me in... <laughs> But could you please join me, most importantly, in thanking Catherine Anyango, Magda Heidel, and Jacek Dukai for a fascinating discussion. Thank you.